Hey everyone, this is S. and Pratt, and today we're going to talk about the new norm. Pokemon has recently transitioned from a seller's market into a buyer's market, and I just want to talk about what to expect moving forward, because I think a lot of people tend to see this too much as a black and white binary, where seller's market is only good for sellers and buyer's market is only good for buyers, when in general you're pretty much going to do the same thing regardless of what macro trend is going on, but I think there's some important patterns happening right now that we've never experienced before. And starting with the fact that we had this abnormal anomaly of a seller's market a couple of years ago because of quarantine and pandemic, and it's not exclusive to collectibles. If you go look at like Peloton or Zoom stock that was really doing well during that time, it's gone way down. And for one big reason, people go out, can go outside now and touch grass and ride a real bike outside of riding one in the grandma house. However, with Pokemon, a lot of the people aren't going outside and touching grass, so they're still here competing, and I think that's very important. I think a lot of people that joined during that time are still here. I'd even go out on a limb and say more people in collectibles stuck around than did in the case of like Peloton and Zoom and things like that. So what that means for today, why you have such a quick transition from seller's market to buyer's market is because those people here now are competing and are optimizing pretty much everything that could be optimized. You know, the things we talk about all the time, record amount of cards being printed, more cards printed in the past two years than the first 10 years. Unbelievable statistic. That stuff can be optimized. Basically, anything that can be optimized will and is. You know, that's the takeaway from this. So what that's doing is one of the new trends is it's making cards sell at the sell price. So what that means is you're buying something at basically its end sell price right when it's released. A really good example of this are Worlds promos. I've been to Worlds from like 2011 until 2019, and every single time I'd buy either staff and or winner's cards at a very consistent range. So for example, staff cards, I could consistently buy for $50 to $100 a piece, all the way from 2010 to 2019 for a good decade. And then after 2020, $500, thanks for coming. That's why I pay minimum. For both of mine, I think my 22 and 23 was like at least $500. Shout out to Pokey Chloe, got the 23 from her. But the point is, is it 10X? And more importantly, if you go look at a lot of those cards I bought for 50 to 100, that's what they're selling for today. So they started at that price and then incrementally went up to the mid to high hundreds where these new promos are starting at the mid to high hundreds. And there's no room there, you know, for them to do anything. They're just immediately selling at the sell price. So that's what that idea means of selling at the sell prices. You don't have this room of growth anymore. It's happening in light speed. And there's an interesting thing happening that you see with Nagabas, where you see this very quick example of like light speed go up, but then something interesting, it cooled off and went down. However, if you played the game, especially with the Umbreon, a couple of my Patreon members did this and sold those Umbreon's quickly, you have this front end opportunity that didn't exist before. You know, going back to the world's promos, the other side of that coin is you couldn't really do anything if you bought it 50 to 100. It was just chilling. You had to really like it and be a weirdo like me who just adored the world's promos from the beginning, but they didn't really move that much. They just kind of chilled out for a while, incrementally grew over time. You're talking years on end where this Nagaba stuff shot up within months. So if you bought it at release, you could have flipped it in those first couple months and made you know a decent return, but then it started to cool down. So this is more to that point of in a buyer's market, it's ultra optimized because again, a lot of those people who came here from quarantine or whatever, whatever exposure points are here now competing, buying, selling, ripping, flipping, doing whatever it is. That's why a lot of those cards that were doing crazy prices, you know, during that era in 2021 have cooled off because Charmander Unlimited is genuinely unlimited. And when you have a lot more people buying and selling that outside of me, Gary, Rusty, and the other, you know, five other people that are around since the beginning, this is what you're left with is a lot more of a buyer situation. However, with that said, the thing I've always shouted and beat into the ground to the point where it's fossil fuel, rarity is always going to win in this scenario. You know, rarity is something that you just can't optimize. I'm not trying to pump its tires, it's just an inherent fact. All these cards behind me are more difficult to optimize for the simple fact that they were limited in their release. We, we got a glimpse of it with Van Gogh, which ties in the previous point as well, about how things sell at the sell price. Van Gogh was a more limited, and then we did have the, you know, it's bend the knee to the Pokemon Center <laughs> that they gave us, you know, an opportunity to buy directly, but it was still limited in that moment of only being at the museum. And what did it do? It caused chaos. It wasn't a bright spot for Pokemon, but the takeaway is that was some type of limitation. That's why everybody was fiending for the card. It's this unique card. You throw a gray hat on Pikachu, everyone loses their mind. But more importantly, you make it a little bit exclusive. It has some type of exclusivity to it, becomes a challenge. It, gets, it increases the heart rate. 
Also, that sell price deal, it's selling immediately at what it would go for you know, on eBay. You had that first, every time this happens, the first PSA 10, it's a premium. And then what, what, what goes on after that? Straight down. The more the pop increases, the lower the price goes. So this ties in again, that idea of rarity. It's just simply a logical objective reality that when you have something that's more difficult to optimize, whether it's in the form of conditional rarity, actual rarity, you know, a box that's very scarce, something like that. You know, this is something that all of us, whether the army of people that joined during quarantine, whoever it is, we just can't optimize it. Even me with all my, you know, no lifer badges in the grandma house and the, the decade plus I've had doing this, like there's no easy way to get like the rare stuff consistently. There's no way to do that. So that's why that K-shape recovery that I talked about before is in full effect right now. And a lot of these cards, good news for buyers, are gonna be like this for the foreseeable future. This is something that is not gonna go away because the bottom line is everybody wants to make money in this. And I'm not saying this to villainize anyone, more power to people chasing a passion. There's people who just like doing this more than working in Amazon more than working or whatever. You know, you definitely see it in the case like Van Gogh to a very like extreme, like a gross extreme where it's like, you're making maybe $5 an hour hustling and grinding and like trampling people to flip your card for $50 or trampling people to flip your ETB for 20 bucks. You see it to that extreme, but the takeaway from all of that, you know, even if it's like a gross scalper or, you know, just someone, you know, chasing a passion is that passion. They'd rather do this type of thing then, you know, go work a, a nine to five or whatever. But the ultimate reality of that is everybody's competing and you are creating another scenario that we've never experienced before where it's just not possible to grade a lot of these raw cards and make money. That is something we have never experienced to this degree. I talked about it kind of a part one to this video about raw versus graded. You are experiencing that right now at a level that I cannot overstate. Like you can't go get Japanese hollows and grade them. You're, you're just handcuffed. There's nothing you could do. I would buy Japanese collections. I know you've all seen it. Anyone who's been to Yahoo Japan at least one time, those Japanese collections that show you like the first two beautiful binder pages and after that it's a bunch of Pidgeys and Pokeballs. I would buy those things every single month, sometimes every single week. I'm not exaggerating. I would. I had a safe search of Pokemon Mass. I think is how it translated directly in Japanese English. I would search that every single day. I would buy collections from there almost weekly. It would be constant. I can't tell you the last time I bought one of those collections because it's not feasible. If you're doing it as a collector, more power to you. But if you're doing it try, as a business to try to make money, try to grade that stuff, it's not possible. You have a better chance say buying stuff already graded and just waiting, doing that like old thing of holding something over time and you know seeing if it, the market conditions change because right now, majority of those Japanese hollows are just, there's no profit margin to grade them. What a PSA seven to nine is selling for 20 to 50 bucks or whatever it is, there's no opportunity there unless you hit a 10, nine in some cases, but 10 in most. And that's true also for things like screen promos, Poncho Pikachus, honestly, a lot of this stuff back here, Gold Stars, another perfect example. If I go right now to Japan, the AP ratio is so bonkers on Gold Stars that a lot of this stuff that's like even in PSA 6, 7 condition ungraded are listed at like PSA 9 prices. So again, you can't possibly make money on it. We have never experienced that level before. These very popular cards, everybody knows what they have. And because again, this idea of rarity and exclusivity, people aren't as motivated to move them, you know, as they would something they could replenish. You know, one of the S and Pratisms I've said for ages now, and if you're new to the channel, is that typically the best thing to do is to sell what you can reacquire quickly and sell less frequently what you reacquire less frequently. And I think you're seeing that a lot in real time now in Japan with things like screen promos, Pancho Pikachus, you know, pick your poison. This stuff where guys are like, okay, if I sell this, how do I get it again, you know, to make money as a business? That's what you're always asking yourself. Where today, because everybody wants to do this, it's so ultra competitive that it's tightening the margins. It's tightening, you know, the rare cards. It's almost like a a split, that K-shaped thing again, where these rare cards, people are reluctant to sell them. And then the lower stuff, it's just like a, a bloodbath where you really can't make money anymore, you know, going from raw to graded. So that's another very interesting thing that's happening. And also with modern chase cards, because they are printed into oblivion, there are more modern cards printed today than at any point in time that can never be overstated. That needs to be printed out, 72 font, bold italicized, right next to Posh Spice and David Beckham's purple wedding photo above your bed. Like that thing needs to be just laminated in front of you at all times. Like the amount of cards today are printed more than the first 10 years of Pokemon. It's unbelievable how many cards are printed. The takeaway from this is it's continuing this idea 
of ultra-optimized competitiveness. That's why it's harder for these cards to continue their trajectory. It's because there's so many of them. They're all the time at Target. They're all the time online. They're all the time everywhere. Anybody can sell them and everybody does. That's why it's so difficult right now for the modern cards to continue their trajectory. Now, with that said, if you scroll back a couple other modern eras, you'll see that those cards are probably doing better because they don't have that insane quantity, because they don't have that immense volume pushing them down. Just like we talked about with Van Gogh Pikachu, more pop, more quantity, what does it do to the price? It goes like this. The higher the quantity, the price goes the opposite typically, and it'll probably plateau at a certain level. But with modern, the printers are literally going burr. Literally, right now as we speak, they are burning. <laughs> like, they're burning. They are going, and it won't stop until Pokemon says, yeah, okay, we're done with this one. We're going to move on to the next. So the takeaway, if you're still with me, is that this idea of modern, you know, I think there's a lot of people in it today. And keep in mind, modern's at a great time. I've said now for a while that this is the golden era. Beautiful art. Everybody's enjoying it from a collecting perspective. But when you're thinking about it monetarily, it's a rough ride because you have this full circle thing happening where when I started out doing this almost two decades ago, there was no indicator of growth. It was a long-term risk. It was a big void of darkness. There was nothing there. You know, there was nothing there to indicate that the trophy cards or whatever big thing it was I was buying back in the day for a fraction of the price now were going to go up at all. There, were no sa there was no sales data. There were no price charts. Instagram didn't exist. People weren't talking into a camera from a grandma house. That stuff was not happening back then. So there was no indicator of growth. Full circle today, with all the optimization, you're in a very similar position, I think, especially with car modern cards now, where you're in uncharted territory where there's so much quantity, more than ever. So you're in this place where there isn't really an indicator of what's going to happen with this level of quantity dependent on you know popularity containing the way it is. Tying back in the original point, about the ebb and flows of people, you know, adjusting when quarantine ended with Peloton, those type of things. You basically have to bank on popularity continuing at the pace it's at now and then perhaps exceeding down the road and or these cards somehow, you know, becoming more scarce, which is really tough again when you have a record amount of quantity out there. So all these reasons are why we're in a buyer's market. And again, it's not a binary of, you know, you do only sellers markets only for sellers, buyers only for buyers. I've been doing the same general thing for almost two decades now. I've definitely adapted over time. You know, what I mentioned before about how I was buying Japanese, you know, collections all the time. Maybe now that adaptation looks more like graded cards, or maybe that goes into a different category. Maybe I go more into new boxes or something like that. The point is, though, you make these minor adjustments in these markets, but you're overall doing, you know, the same general thing. And I think that's the, the takeaway I have from transitioning from a seller to a buyer is I'm still going to be you know, selling every month. I'm still going to be buying every month. I'm basically still going to be doing that same general thing, not touching enough grass. You know, I'm still going to be doing all that. But there are definitely new patterns here and new hurdles that you have to adapt to while still doing that same general thing, if that makes sense. And then the last thing to just to reiterate here, any card that can be optimized will. That just, again, you need to print this out next to your Spice Girls poster. Like any card or item that can be optimized will. There's never been a time where more people are trying to do this for a living. And again, it's not villainizing anyone. It's people chasing a passion. But you got to keep in mind, more people doing that, more competition. Therefore, anything that can be optimized will. The only saving grace is some type of difficulty. That's why you see people swarm and trample each other for like a Van Gogh Pikachu. It's kind of reminiscent of like the 90s Furby Tickle Me Elmo stuff. We're getting that vibe again because that had some exclusivity at the time. You know, we're dealing with that, but there's a lot of cards now. You know, this stuff behind me ranges from old back to new back to like, you know, trophies to prize cards to event cards to, you know, poncho cards. There's a nice variety in Pokemon. I think that's what makes it so rewarding at the end of the day of being engaged. Because even when things transition from sellers to buyers, there's always something going on. There's always some new trend emerging, you know, and that's what I have. Those are the ones that I notice. As usual, you know the deal in the field. Tell me what you think about some of these ideas if you notice them yourself. But that's pretty much it, guys. Till next time.